I never, I never utilized, well, I never utilized the laughter circuit to make other people laugh when I was younger uh, as an attempt to uh, use it as a defensive mechanism. But I did learn to laugh about my own suffering, right? Like Smith was talking about before, to, to laugh at yourself, to laugh at pain, right? Like there's a, it, it, it absolutely has a neuroprotective effect, it does. You, you, you transform almost anything by laughing at it, right? And here's something interesting about um, hallucinogens, in fact, is it? Laughter is often a, a, a big part of it, right? Uh, Terence McKenna described the, the, the deity of his mind as the great cosmic giggle. And there, I, <laughs> I guess you can't really say how much truth is in that unless you've experienced the situations where he came to that conclusion, I suppose, through hallucinogens. But it's... Um, it really does seem absurd and strange, this whole life thing, right? It, it, if you can look and, and look at the contradictions and, and look at the ironies and the, the weird juxtapositions and synchronicities, and, and if you see all of that, it, it, it almost can't be helped to provoke laughter in some sense, right? And that's so weird. That's so weird that God has a sense of humor, right? Or the idea that God has a sense of humor. It's. I think uh, P Peterson has this uh, quote. I'm pretty sure I heard it from Peterson where he says, life can only, there, he said, there's two categories of movies, the tragedy and the, and the comedy. And you need to pick which one you want your life to be. Yeah, well, this is really old dramatic theory going all the way back to the Greeks. Yeah, that there's just tragedy and comedy. And that's essentially it. And you can kind of break them down in other categories after the fact. But yeah, tragedy and comedy. And and you you want to be well, able to laugh at these. Yeah. In, in those cases, comedy doesn't necessarily even have to be funny. Uh, a comedy just means that it ends with a happy ending. And, and so right. there's you can have tragedies where they end in a very dark place that kind of make you not want to have watched it, but so it could be useful that are still funny. But, and then there's Shakespeare who kind of created the tragic comedy where it's just a mixture between the two and which probably yeah, it's, why it, his, it's a lot the of his position of the laughter. Is, so it's, it's the position of the laughter, right? If the laughter is in the middle of the movie um, and not at the end, then it's a tragedy. <laughs> if the laughter is, anywhere else but also found in the end then it's a comedy yeah it's exactly that it, it's because you, you can laugh you know all the way through your life and then suddenly die a terrible painful death or all the people around you die in some awful way right i mean that's that's a tragedy there's uh i watched this analysis uh gosh it's a it's a really great youtube channel but they talk about the hero's journey and they break it down into the plot devices used in movies and whatnot and they said okay you have the person who was timid he's then presented with a um a challenge and that challenge can be really bad it's a dragon has now appeared then there's the doubt phase can he do the dragon like can he kill the dragon can he not and eventually he then decides okay i'm going to try and he commences like the journey phase even though the other bit was part of the journey as well but now he and he has like some trials and tribulations where he tries and learns and then there's the final test where he can you know he can kill the dragon and then from there he's able to return to the village and bring back what he learned so then society can kill more dragons together but then I, I i he never said this in the video but then i hypothesized well then is the tragedy when he goes and confronts the dragon and dies and i think that that would be the be the way it is which is and that's and I think we can take this in a very interesting point because um, if you're in a movie theater and you're watching a tragedy and then something bad happens and one and then the, the, everyone is in the theater is crying, it's actually powerful for them because the movie is actually saying to everybody, everyone in this movie theater is crying because we can all relate to this experience and we're not alone in that. 
but then maybe what's happened now is in society is we don't talk about the things that are going horrifically wrong to us. Uh, specifically, I can think illicitly that this is from the masculine uh, framework because we hear nonstop from feminists about how hard feminine life is. Uh, but for, you know, the MRAs, they get uh, harassed and, and just for even talking about certain masculine issues. And you think about it in terms of movies as well. Now we watch them at home rather than watching them in the theater. So like the power of a tragedy is like you're crying alone or maybe with your partner, hopefully if you have a partner, but I think a lot of people are now watching movies alone rather than with any catharsis that happens in the theater from acknowledging it. And I want to tie this back into the point about cutting. Um, and I've thought about this a lot in terms of why women are more prone to cry compared to men. And it actually turns out that women's tears have a pheromone in there to actually make men submissive. Um, and then that seems to me that, and women are higher in neuroticism, which is the proclivity for negative emotions and low neurotic people are more stable, but if they have a depression, it lasts longer, uh, it seems. So it's like the balance of being able to express negative emotions very quickly. Um, and it seems the benefit of this uh, behavior is to invite other people into the wrongs of your life. Uh, so if you're upset uh, and you're crying, then it invites people in to fix your issues because you're overwhelmed. You can't fix them by yourself. So you're inviting other people in to hopefully sympathize and empathize to then try and contribute to help you fix your issues. And then it seems like why do women cut more than men? And it seems that is a way of creating physical damage to then hopefully be a cry for help. Why do women do drug, like less effective suicidal methods compared to men when men are way more successful uh, in killing themselves than women? It seems it's also that cry for help. A lot of women will call someone up before they take the drug overdose uh, as a way of, or leave like cues and things like that as a way of hopefully that society will then come to the rescue. Uh, because now they're overwhelmed and it seems like the avenues for men to express that vulnerability uh have been taken away as well as the avenues for men to get help when they do express those that vulnerability has also been taken away yeah uh, absolutely yeah. i agree crying is a please come help me right it's a it's a physical manifestation of an internal um, sensation right it's yeah. and this is what the uh that that person who dressed up as a man to infiltrate the man the men's communities found as well which was she's like i've never seen so many men cry because eventually when they would go out to their hunting groups and things in their camping groups finally they could actually talk like you know to the very tight-knit little community of trust that they actually made in these communities uh yeah. finally now they had a you know one or two guys that they could actually talk to they wouldn't cry in front of the entire group but there would be and maybe some would but then there would be one or two men in that group that they could actually finally talk about their issues with and then get some help and it seems the church system really played a role in that in terms of the men could go to the priest or the elder men and then try and get help and support in that way but then in a modern secular society, these type of groups um, have been destroyed, it seems. Yeah, or, or at least their effectiveness questioned a great deal by, by uh, our current society. Without offering anything effective in its place. And but, but I think that's a problem. Sorry, it, it, I didn't mean to talk over you. Just uh, I didn't yeah, get what it, you said. It, it broke up there for a second. Yeah. Uh, it actually seems this is a good uh, way of moving into the next point uh, oh. that we have written down. Oh. I got a couple of things to add. No, go some. Boy, boy, boy. Uh, this is something, uh, this was my second point, but uh, I'll go ahead with it first. I think this is what Trump did. He took this very private situation that these men groups have and put it on the you know, national TV, because uh, what people were saying was this guy is talking just like me, like he's not hiding anything. He's just 
being straight and honest about uh, his shit. Uh, so that appealed to a lot of people because uh, normally uh, once you go out of your hunting ground into the society, you know you are supposed to be some other uh, you know fake shit. And uh, he was doing things that other people can only dream of. Uh, so they were probably sitting in their living rooms, clapping and <laughs> going crazy that finally he, someone has the guts to do it. So that was really interesting. Uh, that's more or less like a uh, little bit funny point. But I have more serious point to make, uh, which is, uh, uh, and this is certainly true because uh, uh, I have heard a lot of uh, uh, right wing uh, uh, people uh, talk about how they were, uh, when he was saying all those controversial things, they knew that he was going to at least uh, no, get the nomination. And they were just clapping and uh, in the privacy of their own rooms, they were just jumping. They were going to court. And, uh, uh, so uh, my other point was about tragedy, uh, which is, uh, Uh, I'm defining tragedy as uh, uh, by being where you don't want to be. Uh, and uh, tragedy to me doesn't seem like a tragedy sometimes because uh, there is something good about a man who uh, has the guts to confront the dragon and you know die. Uh, so he's where he wants to be. He wants to go out there and fight the dragon. That's what he was supposed to do. That's what he's doing. Uh, to me, if he did something else, that would be a tragedy. So dying is a secondary thing in that respect. Uh, 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 would you follow your dream and go where you want to go, even if most likely ending was that you die? Uh, so to me, not doing that, sitting in the bar and having a drink and laughing, uh, to me, that would be a tragedy in that, that case, because uh, you, you might say that, oh, that uh, idiot died. Uh, so hey, it's a tragedy, but it really is not. Because well, all right. So this is, a, this is a really good point, Smith, because we all, let's say, didn't. Well, so this is OK. All right. So the traditional way that you that we view this is nobody chose to be born, right? Your parents chose for you to have you. And then suddenly, four or five years later, you kind of come to consciousness and awareness and you start to realize, hey, I'm a thing, right? You didn't choose to be born, but everybody's on the same adventure. Once you're alive, once you're here, you will die at the end. There's no escaping that. Like the story that you're in, you are going to die no matter what at the end. So that, that can't be the end of it, right? It has to be what you do prior to the death. Everybody's getting the same ending, right? It's what you do while you're alive. And I think that is the, the, the best way to visualize that or maybe to analogize it or to reframe the perspective, let's say, is to say that you chose to be here right that collectively and yet individually each person chooses to be alive right they they're choosing to be here and that this is where they want to be right that that's uh, albert camus uh, philosophical question again the, the only real ph philosophical question is whether or not we should commit suicide so everybody who's currently alive has answered that question in the negative right that, that we should stay alive we should keep going. There's something more worthwhile to achieve before we're dead. I think it's totally true, by the way. I, I'm like, if we could just infect people with the right ideas, that, I think that's one of them. That everyone who is alive, no matter how bad it is, is continually choosing, no matter what, to be here. And if that's the case, then there is some potential, some possibility to improve things, to laugh about things, right? There's also those who, I, I, I'm not sure if this is a term I came up with or I heard it somewhere else, but there's the idea of a slow suicide. So then these are the people who then can't make up the courage or the determination 
to actually decide to kill themselves or even decide to live. So then they do death by overeating, by passivity. They just sit around on the couch and, and do nothing with their life because they're too afraid to live it and they're too afraid to end it. Um, and then that's part of why the perceived, like, so Alan Watson and this idea of, you know, life can also be a comedy, like the absurdist thing. I think Camus uh, lended a bit to absurdism where it's like, like, because one of the wrestles here is the notion of an afterlife uh, as well. So it's like you can have, have a, um, a, you commit a physical suicide where you kill yourself as a way of dealing with the question of life. You can commit an intellectual suicide as like the belief of the afterlife or, or a, uh, a power that makes uh, things kind of worth living. Or you can then just say, I have no idea what's the answer. Um, however, being passive is not something that lends uh, good results. So I'm going to live my life as if I can make it a comedy. Um, and yeah, the, there's power uh, in that, which is because the, there's a fear of losing, right? Like fear is also what prevents people from wishing to reach their dreams. But if you have the ability of saying, hey, to eliminate that fear through the use of laughter, then that's incredibly powerful. So for instance, you go and try and learn a new skill and then you make a mistake and you can laugh at it. Uh, that's way better than thinking, oh my gosh, I make a mistake. Everyone's going to laugh at me. Um, and then use that as fear to actually not ever live. And it's, uh, yeah. You just laugh with them. <laughs> yeah. Just laugh with them, right? That's, yeah. that's the great key. If you can just laugh with the people that laugh. And this is, this is the, the, the bit of the kernel of truth that the comedians discover growing up. If you can just get people to laugh with you, no matter what their initial position was, during laughter, I, I mean, maybe, who, kills, who kills while they're laughing, right? Like who maybe, maybe, while they're laughing? Maybe the sensitivity here is when everyone is laughing at you making a mistake, then it's sensitive to then think they are laughing at me, which is true to an extent. But if you go deeper, then what they're doing is they're laughing at you making the mistake, right? They're, they're laughing at you being uh, perpetuating that you're a fool in that moment. So then if you can, if you can separate yourself in that moment from the fool to being the observer of the fool, then you have the ability to laugh at yourself with the other people. So then you actually just form the laughter of other people to not be at you, but it's to actually transform the laughter of the other people with yourself to be the full of you of the yesteryear, right? And I think that's like the for me once, shame on me, for me twice. Uh, no, what is it? For me once, uh, it's an accident. For me, uh, I can't remember what it is. Fool me <laughs> once, shame on you. Fool me twice, right. shame on me. Yeah. Or and, if you're uh, <laughs> Who knows what it ends up? <laughs> yeah so so that seems to be like the real power there which is the ability to separate yourself from the thing that made the mistake uh to be the person who can now acknowledge that you're different i think that's the sensitivity issue there and the the emotional intelligence issue i shouldn't say emotional intelligence i should say emotional competency because it's not our uh, intelligence I, I, I would, I would not care either way. I, mean, I, I think that the objection to the use of intelligence there and in, in the psychological community is uh, nitpicking. A bit of a puerile one. Yeah, it's just, yeah. it's not important. You know? yeah. But psychometricians are very, very particular about their terms. <laughs> yeah. Got a question for uh, Ben. After that, we can move on to the next uh, thing. Uh, when uh, you said uh, intellectuals who said by believing in some higher power, uh, so are you saying people who believe in God and uh, afterlife kind of outsource their existential issues and stop thinking about it? Is that what you are saying? Uh, yeah, so, okay, so it was Kierkegaard and Camus. So I'm not saying this. I, this is what the absurdists say. So Kierkegaard and Camus are two of the, uh, the uh, famous absurdists. 
so I'm reading this now directly from the Wikipedia page. Let me actually share my screen because I, I don't want to say anything that's um, uh, particularly incorrect on this. So if let you me... do, we'll just laugh at you. All right. So, all right. I think uh, everyone. Okay, that could be a bit too wide. So let me try and bring it uh, down. So okay. So the absurdist philosophy. The absurd rises out of the fundamental disharmony between the individual search for meaning and the meaningless of the universe. As beings looking for meaning in a meaningless world, humans have three ways of resolving this dilemma. Kierkegaard and Camus uh, describe the solutions in the works of Sickness unto Death and the Myth of Sisyphus. Respectively, suicide, escaping existence, a solution in which a person ends one's own life. Both Kierkegaard and Camus dismiss the viability of this option. Camus states that it does not counter the absurd Rather, the act of ending one's existence only becomes more absurd. Then it's a religious or spiritual or abstract belief in a transcendent realm, being, or idea. A solution in which one believes in the existence of a reality that is beyond the absurd and as such has meaning. Kierkegaard stated that the belief in anything beyond the absurd requires an irrational but perhaps necessary religious acceptance in such an intangible and empirically unprovable thing now common, commonly referred to as the leap of faith. However, Camus regarded this solution and others as philosophical suicide. Then there's the acceptance of, of the absurd, a solution in which one accepts the absurd and continues to live in spite of it. Camus endorsed this solution, believing that by accepting the absurd, one can achieve the greatest extent of one's freedom and that by recognizing no religious or other moral constraints and by revolting against the absurd while simultaneously accepting it as unstoppable, one could possibly be content from the personal meaning constructed in the process. Kierkegaard, on the other hand, regarded this solution as de <laughs> demonic. De de is, that's not demonic. Uh, dem uh, demonic. Related to oh, okay. It is uh, kind of like demonic. So demoniac yeah. madness. Yeah. Uh, he rages most of all most of all at the thought that eternity might get into its head to take his misery from him. Um, so it, it's pretty interesting. So they have like this little table here about the different ways or the, how the different beliefs uh, deal with uh, this issue of life. It, it's a really interesting article to read. Mm -hmm. it, it's funny just, that you bring up Kierkegaard just because when we were talking earlier about the, the cosmic giggle that uh, reminded me of a kind of quote that he had uh, I'll, I'll read the quick version of it. When I was young, I forgot how to laugh in the cave of Trophonius. Uh When I was older, I opened my eyes and beheld reality, at which I began to laugh. And since then, I have not stopped laughing. It's a, I, I, it's a interesting correlation, I, I think, between the two. How once you have that complete scope of reality and, and understanding of existence, be it through uh, psychedelics or through <laughs> deep pondering and witnessing of the world around you. Uh, it, the only reasonable uh, <laughs> response is to have that kind of self-reflective laugh at yourself and everything against you. And, and you were saying earlier about his uh, thoughts on the afterlife. And, and I this is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit recently is because there, there's great use in having the idea of heaven, but it, it's, I, I think the proper response is to think of heaven as a potential reality for the world around us. And I think that's possibly what Jesus was trying to say in the, uh, was that the Lord's prayer or, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So kind of trying to manifest the potential perfection of some sort of utopia. I don't really want to say utopia just because I know that's probably not ever something available. And probably to try to manifest it would be uh, something not... <laughs> uh, the, not something that I would want to bring about, uh, but but still having that idea of we can make the world around us better. And uh, what is it? After he had died, he said, today or you will be with me in paradise. Or I think there, 
a lot of people kind of come to that idea of him talking about an afterlife, but it could also, I believe, uh, be true in, in regards to the world around them. That, that was after he had, like, was crucified and was speaking to the, uh, the, the robber thief. beside yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. And, and how through that action of taking on uh, all the sins of the world, that could free us in a kind of way to ex try to bring about heaven on earth. Yeah, I totally agree. Yep. That, uh, that the kingdom of heaven is the, the alternative eschatological end result to Armageddon, right? So we are always headed towards either the total collapse and destruction of humanity or the best possible place we could ever be in, right? And so we could look at it that way. Like right now, all that exists, all the culture we've made, all the buildings we built, all the interactions and relationships, all of it is the best we could have ever done, right? You can think of it that way. So right now, this is heaven. Everything around us is heaven. It's not good enough though. So we have to keep improving it, right? We have to notice the things that can be improved and keep improving it. And if you look, that's what's happening, right? We're, we're improving over time, trying to improve the lives of ourselves and others. And to the extent that we include others in the life of ourselves, we do a better job of it, I think, because each of us contributes to the social structure of the whole. And if, yeah, it, it's just the way that everything is built right now, Mm -hmm. And, maybe that's and, and uh, I, I think, uh, as you were saying, there's the, the two possible options of kind of this uh, heaven on earth and then there's hell on earth that you can also bring about. And, and I think of the, the book of Revelation as kind of a warning, as many of the prophets uh, in the Bible have gone through, of what could occur and will occur if, if the, of course through symbolic usage uh, of what uh, i don't know the, yeah, it's, yeah it's 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 what yeah, has it's occurred that, it, it has occurred mm -hmm. it keeps occurring over and over again it's cyclical right yeah you you destroy it's the phoenix right you you have an armageddon and if anything's left over its best options are to improve the things that cause the Armageddon and move on, right? Yeah. So I, the, we've uh, had several the, collapses uh, historically. Sorry. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the YouTube channel, uh, Logos Made Flesh, on his website, he has a, a quick little interpretation of revelations. I, I, I really, uh, that has helped me quite a lot in understanding it a little bit better. And, and you're right, it's, it's something that is not something that just applies to our future, but it's something that applies to events that have occurred in our past and in our present currently. And it's something that we need to realize and try to, I don't know, form it in whatever way we can. I don't know. I got an issue with what Ben was saying. Sorry, uh, what Tyler was saying. Uh, so, Tyler, there is one group of people who wants to improve the state of the world uh, better than all of us combined, uh, which would be these people. I, I've been there, man. I have listened to those uh, uh, groups and those left-wing comedians, and they are so much into uh, improving the world and making things better. And it's just that they have a lot of bad ideas so so that's like uh, uh, just like porn hijacks the reward center of the brain that just like hijacking the your ability to make the world better place and doing it with these horrible ideas and then actually making it worse it's just crazy man well i think the problem with the the left right now is that they're well it's always been the case and and this is the probably the fundamental difference that Peterson hinges all of his arguments upon is is the the direction with which change uh, must occur or the locus with uh, where it occurs. So 
the left says we need to change other people, right? Everyone but me is evil and making wrong choices. And, and that's what the virtue signaling is that, that you see so often, right? I'm so good. I'm so great. It's society outside of me that needs to be fixed. And that's the problem, I think, because the, the alternative is the much better one, which is I'm broken. I need to change. I should fix myself, right? And, and if everyone did that, then we'd have heaven. If everyone worked on their own individual problems, then we would have heaven. You can't force other people to be your own narrow. See, like, you're taking the single vision of one person, if you're leftist, and trying to, you're, you're saying that that's the correct vision, and then applying it to all people, versus the collective grassroots, uh, bottom-up development of what heaven is by everybody improving their own lives individually. Yeah, you want to reduce the risk of blowing up other people as a suicide bomber in the name of God because you think your way is better. That's a great example. What, what? Can you please explain, Ben? <laughs> uh, did, did you not, did it break up or something? Or, or did,